Well, greetings, everybody. Once again, we welcome you to our weekly online adult Bible study series. I'm Pastor Steve Wagner here at Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Lombard, Illinois. And it's my joy to once again uh, bring you another installment of our study today. Um, so we will be doing the usual thing. And so today we are looking at the um, first reading and the gospel lesson for this upcoming uh, Sunday's uh, pericopes, uh, if you're doing the three-year series, Series B, as we do here at Trinity, and that's going to be for Easter 2, the second Sunday of Easter, of the Easter season. And the two texts we're going to be looking at today comes to us from Acts chapter 4, and from John chapter 20. Acts 4, John 20. So to kick us off, as usual, let's go ahead and take a look at our theme. So this is our theme this week. The Holy Spirit causes the gospel to unify and grow the church. So the gospel unifies and grows the church, and it's done by the work of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel. The Holy Spirit causes the gospel to unify and grow the church. All right. Well, let's dive right into it. Uh, firstly, as you might have noticed if you've been uh, following lectionaries, uh, during the Easter season, typically there is no uh, Old Testament lesson. Uh, the first reading, there's a first reading instead, and it's from the book of Acts. I mean, there isn't anything in the Old Testament that would talk about the aftermath of the Easter resurrection of Jesus, but that's exactly what the book of Acts is about. So the book of Acts typically in that season is the first reading. So Acts chapter 4, the first reading is from verses 32 through 35. So let's go ahead and get that up on the screen and take a look and see what it says. All right. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. All right. So our theme is pretty... Uh, pretty relevant right out of the chute here. So let's go into this. Now, I, I guess like we said, a little context, this is the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, uh, in case you're not aware, was written by Luke, the same guy that wrote the gospel of Luke. In fact, um, Luke and Acts, if you join them together, could be one really, really, really long book. Um, it is broken up. Uh, where uh, the book of Acts starts with the ascension of Jesus into heaven, because uh, that way the gospel of Luke will be about the ministry of Jesus when he was here. And then the book of Acts talks about, you know, now that Jesus has ascended into heaven, <clears throat> how did Jesus continue to work through his church and, and you know, the story of the early church. So um, this section... Acts chapter of Acts chapter four um, talks about the early church and the life of the early church and some characteristics of the early church. Uh, if you want to know how things actually ought to work in a perfect world, which we don't live in a perfect world, but in a perfect world, um, if the church was uh, <clears throat> run according to God's design, you would see how it's run in Acts uh, two, three, and four especially Acts 4. So what we're talking about here, it, it's printed and it's in Scripture, so uh, it shows us how God 
would like to see things working. All right, Lori says, this is the church that acts as being the hand and feet of Jesus. Yes, by showing everyone uh, the love of Christ and how you live. All right, so it starts off. It says that the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Now, when you hear that, right away, one word that describes that is unity. And so we see how what the, the thing about this uh, passage that we're looking at today is how unified uh, the church was. And again, that's the work of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel. So the church is unified, and of course, um, throughout the book of Acts, you see tremendous explosion and growth of the early church, and so that'll be the growth that the Holy Spirit brings. Here you're seeing the, the unity, the life of the church, and how unified they were. So according, one heart, one soul. So according to God's design, there are to be no divisions within his church. And when we say no divisions, we mean no divisions of any kind. No divisions according to age. There should be no divisions according to social status. There should no, be no divisions according to economic status. No divisions according to race or, race or ethnicity. No divisions according to gender, per, physical appearance, or any other dividing issue. So no divisions means uh, things like that just simply don't matter. Because, you know, when the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts and we're with other brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, who cares what their age is, who cares what their financial status is, who cares what their race is. It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit causes us to love everyone. Now, one of the interesting things about it also, no divisions, um, that would also mean no divisions in terms of doctrine. Um, but you see how, you know, a Holy Spirit-driven church tries to operate in a sinful world like we have. Um, you see all the different denominations within Christianity and Americanism today. And, <clears throat> you know, every Christian denomination that professes Jesus as Lord and Savior over sin and death, uh, these are filled with heaven-bound believers and brothers and sisters in Christ uh, throughout denominational lines. There are differences between the churches. Um, and it's not like the differences are inconsequential. But at the same time, these differences don't necessarily disqualify other folks um, from the kingdom of, of God. But, you know, it's funny how, you know, again, God's design will work great as long as there's no sin. But yet this is this is what God wants. And if you notice something that you'll notice in all throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit has a way of unifying. It is the sinful nature that divides. The Holy Spirit unifies and the sinful nature divides. And so the first thing you notice about the early church is there was no divisions between them. They were unified in every way you could think of. It says that they shared everything they had. Uh, what's the exact verbiage? No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Okay, so they shared everything. Everything in common. <clears throat> so a willingness to share is also a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Not only is it going to unify in terms of togetherness, but in terms of material blessings too. Um, the Holy Spirit causes people to understand that the stuff that we own isn't actually ours in the first place, but rather the stuff that we own, um, God gave to us, and God intends us to use it for uh, His 
uh, bidding and according to his will, that would be a tremendous platform for a good stewardship conversation within the church. But that basic principle is in place. It's not ours. It's God's in the first place. And because it's God's, we shouldn't be selfish and we should be willing to share things. Now, the, the thing here that is important to point out is that sometimes uh, I at least have seen this passage be used to try to justify um, a political socialist system where, okay, you're supposed to share everything. Uh, it's biblical. Well, see, the concept is in the Bible, but the one big difference is that this is something they did because they wanted to do this. This was not done under governmental compulsion or even compulsion of the church. Nobody made them uh, want to do anything or want to share everything. They just shared everything because it's what the Holy Spirit led them to do. All right, so let's see. Having a little hiccup here on my side. I don't think the stream dropped on y'all's end. Uh, we'll get back here in a second. Okay. Now, so in other words, uh, they shared everything because they want to. Nobody made them to. Nobody told them they had to. This is what they wanted to do. And I would argue that's the one difference. The other thing that is uh, worth noting about this it's kind of remarkable that they were willing to share with each other given the current circumstances. This is in the immediate aftermath of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so the culture at this moment, at this very, very early stage of the church, was rather anti-church, the society was. And um, there was tremendous persecution. The, the society at the moment was anti-church. Now, that uh, that didn't last long because as the church continued to spread its message, there was incredible growth. But at first, you know, it was an underground operation. Uh, if nothing else, they were outlaws according to the Sanhedrin, the, uh, the council of the temple. And so the council was going to stop any Christian ministry by whatever means it took. And this is where, you know, early on before his conversion... St. Paul, when he was Saul, was kind of the hammer man for um, putting the kibosh to this. So this was sort of a secret society at first, and that meant they were persecuted, and that meant that resources could be difficult to come by. But it's funny that they weren't really worried about the fact that, well, maybe times are going to get tough, maybe we should save, maybe we should hold on to stuff for ourselves, because after all, you know, we're all going to be broke soon. None of that entered in their way of thinking. They just shared everything because that's what they wanted to do. So this is what the Holy Spirit, this is the attitude that the Holy Spirit will instill when the Holy Spirit is at work. Now it says that the apostles gave their testimony with great power. And yes, these apostles are the apostles from the gospel lessons. There are 12 of them. Uh, they had lost Judas, but then they had called Matthias early on in Acts chapter 1. So these are those apostles. And it says that their preaching of Christ and him crucified was having this kind of impact. Now, here you go. With the gospel being brought into it, the Holy Spirit's doing the work. The end result is unification, but the means is this gospel. The apostles were preaching the word of God, and it was having tremendous impact on the early church. It was feeding this unification and these healthy Christian attitudes that we're talking about here. All right. And it says that grace was upon them all.
so when they were living this way, there was nothing but joy. There was peace. There was unity. God was blessing them. So, again, this is the blueprint for church according to God's design. Uh, these are one of the uh, some of the attributes that a church ought to be experiencing. And again, it gets its power from the Holy Spirit. Now, the intriguing thing is the conclusion of this. It says, as a result, there were no needy people among them. So when anybody needed anything, the people who had stuff would like bring money or sell assets and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet. Which also is remarkable. Because that meant that the people were fully trusting in the apostles to do the right thing with the donated funds in the proper way. Now remember, the apostles were the first pastors of the church. And it, it all, uh, you know, the Acts. The Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4 church that's depicted in Scripture always amazes me. Um, you know, again, when this design here is what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit is at work, the Satan and the sinful nature always steps up to try to kind of put the block down to this, to disrupt this. But could you imagine this complete level of trust? And, of course, for that to be the case, then the apostles, i.e. the pastors, would have to have earned the complete level of trust. But, you know, in this day and age, pastors are sinful. They do stuff that they shouldn't do. Parishioners are sinful. They do stuff that they shouldn't do. Um, and so as a result, like here at Trinity, nobody fully trusts me with all of this stuff, and nor should they, because I'm sinful. Uh, so this is why we have not only me, but me as part of the church council with all of the different chairmen and chairwomen from the various boards. And we all get together, we pray for God's guidance, and collectively we make such decisions. But, you know, if there was no sin interfering, you know, it's funny how that wouldn't be necessary. <clears throat> all right, so you see the Holy Spirit at work, working through the gospel, and it has this unifying uh, component to it. And then again, as Acts progresses, you would see how it ended up growing the church as well. Well, actually, uh, the growth started in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Uh, Peter's sermon <clears throat> caused 3,000 convert. Oh, the gospel, the Holy Spirit working through Peter's sermon caused 3,000 uh, conversions that one day alone. All right. So the Holy Spirit worked through the gospel in the early church. Now, let's step over to the gospel lesson of John chapter 20. <clears throat> now this, if you've been a Lutheran for a while, this lesson is going to be one that is, you know, you're going to know this one. This one is going to be familiar to you. <clears throat> it's commonly used in Lutheran teachings. Uh, for certain things like we're going to talk about here, for example, the office of the keys, the doctrine of ordination, and so forth. <clears throat> but one thing I noticed, it is one of the very few uh, gospel lessons or texts that is in all three years of the lectionary. Now, there are some, um, there are some uh, uh, church festival days, like for example the Reformation, it's the same three texts every year. Well, in Easter 2, there is a different first reading, there's a different epistle, but in Easter 2, in all three years of the lectionary cycle, John 20 is the gospel lesson in all three years, and I believe that's the only one where uh, it's the constant of the three the other two will change, but this verse is the constant, and that means there's a lot of, you know, good stuff to be said in it. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and pull it up and tear into it. We're actually going to break it up into two sections. First, actually, let's look at verses 19 
through 23 of John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, with the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Okay. Uh, that one may be familiar. There's a lot of really great stuff in there. So let's take a look at it. So first it mentions that this is the first day of the week. And we can glean from that that this happens in late afternoon, early evening of the first Easter. So this is the day that they discovered the empty tomb. And it says that the doors were locked for the fear of the Jews. All right, now understand here. <clears throat> so this is just a couple days after Good Friday. Um, if you were to put yourself into the minds and the hearts of the apostles, it probably wouldn't have been the best place to be because um, they all knew that on Good Friday, all of them behaved rather sinfully. Every single one of them deserted Jesus. Peter, who no, Peter, no doubt, uh, was feeling especially bad because he denied he even knew Jesus three times. And so they're upset about that. And then they had that feeling that, okay, the powers that be and the, the leaders, the, the leading council, the Sanhedrin, they took Jesus out. And it was a pretty spectacular thing, the way they stirred up the whole crowd into some sort of frenzy, some sort of temporary hysteria that allowed Jesus to be crucified. And so if you were them, you would probably rightly question, you know, if they could do that to Jesus, they could probably do it to us too. And because they may do it to us, uh, they actually might do it to us because we were Jesus's uh, close associates. So who knows how this is going to work here? All right, so they were afraid that the Jews were going to come for them next, so they are in hiding. They are locked away in hiding. But then something weird happens. Jesus came and stood among them. Now that's significant for a couple of reasons. All right, number one... This shows Jesus' divinity, the divinity of Jesus, fully God and fully man. This shows that he was fully God, because after all, the fact that he could just walk through a locked door and stand in the middle of people, um, yeah, you know, only God can do that. So that in and of itself would have freaked them out, no doubt. But then, like we just said, they could not have possibly have been happy to see Jesus because they're going to wonder what his intentions are. Okay, they know what they did on Good Friday, and uh, it's like, oh crap, he's here. He's probably coming to punish us. He's going to zap us into dust because that's exactly what we deserve. So they could not have been happy to see Jesus at first. So that was probably a terrifying moment for him. But when Jesus appears in the room, the thing that Jesus says, of all the things he could have said, and of all the things they were afraid he might say, Jesus says, Peace be with you.
So Jesus puts their hearts and their fears at ease. He declares that he did not come in judgment, but he comes in peace. Now, the thing is, how is one at peace with God? One is at peace with God through forgiveness. God forgiving the sins of the world. God forgiving your sins. And he forgives your sins through repentance and faith. So, Jesus is saying, look, I know you guys are uptight about how you guys acted on Friday. And you guys ought to be because you guys did me wrong. But I forgive you. I forgive you. Peace be with you. My peace be with you. You are forgiven. I'm not here for judgment. I am here in peace. And so that no doubt um, made them feel infinitely better. And then he does something weird. He shows them his hands and his side. Now remember, the hands still had the nail marks from when he was nailed to the cross. And the side, you might recall, the... Uh, to make sure he was dead, they pierced him in the side with a spear. So he's got the hole in the side, the holes in the hands. And so he's showing them his hands in his side. And that very simply was proof. It's proof that it really is me. Okay, this isn't an imposter. This isn't a joke. This isn't a game. I'm not a ghost, by the way. I'm fully bodily alive. And yet I'm proving it to you. And I'm showing you the marks because that way you know that it's truly me. Now, not only, though, was it was more than just proof. It was also showing them the basis of their forgiveness. The basis of their forgiveness. In other words, peace be with you. I forgive you, and you are forgiven because of this. Jesus knew that they had faith in him as Savior. He knew that they are repentant. And so because Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins, it would be unjust for God not to forgive them. So he's showing them the hands and the side to prove it's truly him and to show them why they are at peace with him. All right, Phyllis, Jesus instructed his apostles to declare God's peace among the household when he said, yes, um, <clears throat> that's how, that's what actually happened all throughout the book of Acts. That's how it grew. And it grew not just because the disciples were making the proclamation that Jesus told them to, but it's because when the proclamation that Jesus tells them to be made is made, the Holy Spirit goes to work, and it's the Holy Spirit that converts hearts. Very good. Oh, Phyllis gets a ding. And their reaction, as one would imagine, is they were glad. Probably a better word than glad would be relieved. Although glad to, glad because they did love Jesus, but glad and relieved that he's showing them mercy. Uh, then Jesus starts saying some stuff that's pretty doggone important. Jesus says, As the Father sent me, now I am sending you, as Phyllis said. Father sent me, I am sending you. Now remember, like we have said repeatedly, the apostles were the first pastors of the church. They are the professional full-time theologians. Um, all Christians are to spread the word of Jesus uh, both through witnessing, through acts of mercy, through love, through kindness. Um, and they get the ability to do that through the word and the sacrament that is 
preached and administered by the pastor on behalf of the church. But this starts to show you the role. Now you start to see the plan. Okay. Pastors are sent by Jesus to do a job. And so Jesus is... And that's that's also... That's big not only because are the apostles being forgiven, they're being restored to the calling that they were groomed to do all throughout the ministry of Jesus in the first place. They're going to get to be pastors after all, even though none of them deserve it. The truth is no pastor deserves to be a pastor. But uh, Jesus decides who is and who isn't, and when he is, Jesus is the one that sends. Jesus is the one that equips. Jesus sends and equips pastors. And then in the context of word and sacrament ministry within the church, Jesus, through the pastor, is equipping the Christians to uh, have a ministry of sorts in their day-to-day -day lives. Then... He breathed on them. And that seems kind of weird. What's that about? Well, it's really not so weird if you think about it. In Genesis 1, when man was given the gift of physical life through uh, from God, it was God breathing the breath of life into man's lungs. So now... We're not talking about physical life being given, but we're talking about spiritual eternal life being given. So it's perfectly, it makes perfect sense if you compare it to Genesis 1, that God would be breathing life into people. That's what he does. So this is Jesus breathing isn't so strange after all, if you stop and think about it. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. So here again... You start to see the uh, the theme. All right, so this Holy Spirit that caused all this in Acts chapter 4, now that same Spirit is going to come into play in the work of the apostles. Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But let's talk about this first. If you forgive... If you forgive the sins of any, that's important because the ultimate work of the gospel is forgiveness. We've said that a couple of times today. The ultimate work of the gospel is to give God's forgiveness to sinful, repentant, believing people. So if you forgive the sins of, of any, this is what the point is. And he says, if you forgive those sins... They are truly forgiven. They are forgiven. That pass that's that point, that verse, that statement cannot be understated. Um, this talks about something known as the so called office of the keys. In Lutheran theology. Uh, comes from Luther's small catechism. We teach this to our uh, eighth graders. Um, why office of the keys? Well, there's references of keys uh, when this is discussed in Matthew 16. But here, uh, same thing. A door, imagine a door being locked. If you have a locked door, the only way through a locked door is with a key. The key unlocks the door. Well, imagine the door to heaven being locked to us because of our sin. And there's no way to get in unless you unlock the door. And the only key to unlock the door is forgiveness. The forgiveness of sins is the only way into heaven, but it's the key that unlocks the locked door, the forgiveness of sins. So it's referred to in Lutheran theology as the office of the keys. The, um, the office of the keys is that special authority given by Jesus to the church to have the, sin, the forgiveness of sins 
distributed so that heaven would be unlocked to these repentant, believing people. And, of course, a church calls an ordained pastor to um, do the unlocking on their behalf, to do the preaching, to do the administering of the sacraments on behalf of the church. Lori says, being the, given the keys to the kingdom was a symbol of honor. And, you know, the context of <clears throat> being entrusted with such a thing in, you know, a kingdom in terms of like actual castles and stuff. Yeah, that was a big deal because they didn't just give the keys to just any old schmuck. You know, this guy, the person had to be, you know, trustworthy and had to be honorable. But you know what? The same thing should be viewed and said as it is... Um, to the office of a pastor, it is actually a tremendous honor. It's an honor of which I am by no means worthy of doing. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I often wonder, you know, why God keeps me doing this because I feel like I, you know, I, I don't do the best job as I could do. I'm not worthy, but yet he does. And so while, um, you know, my ability falls short as a sinful man. Oftentimes I do greatly appreciate the honor and the privilege that it is. And I literally thank God for that every day. It is an honor and it is a privilege. And it's, it's an honor and a privilege because through the ministry, people are quite literally getting snatched out of the bowels of hell and shoved up into heaven. Um, this is a good time to discuss a couple of things. This is a good time to give a brief discussion on uh, ordination, at least the Lutheran understanding of it, and the Lutheran understanding of confession and absolution. Ordination, you've seen ordination all throughout um, throughout Scripture. You look back at the, uh, at the Old Testament, and... Um, in the Old Testament, you had priests, and you had people that weren't priests. And there's been plenty of scripture lessons where only the priests were authorized to do certain things. Only the priests were authorized to initiate the sacrifices, to lead worship. That could only be done by certain people according to God's design. And that was the ordained priests who were consecrated for that calling. And, you know... This issue of being authorized to do something, that's not anything new at, at all, even in our age. I mean, uh, for those of you who have worked for a company at some point, or maybe are now, you know, I'll ask you the question, when you work for them or the one you work for now, do you have access to payroll records? Well, your answer is going to depend on what your job is. If you're a member of accounting, if you're a member of the Human Resources Department, chances are good that you just might. If you're a member of the general sales staff or if you're a member of operations, you probably don't have access to company payroll because you're not authorized to, to access the information. Some people are authorized in a, co in a company setting, some aren't. Same thing in Christian ministry. Some people are authorized to administer the means of grace, to preach the gospel, to baptize uh, to uh, uh, consecrate and administer communion, to uh, pronounce confession and absolution. Some people are authorized to do that and some aren't. And the, the source of authorization for that is ordination. Um, so ordination isn't something that went away after the Old Testament. The idea that only certain people are authorized to do certain things within a church is a very New Testament thing. The role has changed because we no longer perform sacrifices because Jesus was the ultimate final sacrifice on the cross. So sacrifices are no longer necessary. But um, there still is the idea that not anybody is called to get into a pulpit and preach. Not anybody is called to actually baptize in a congregation. That's what an ordained person is called to do because... In Lutheran thought, ordination gives the person being ordained the authority to speak on behalf of God, which leads to the confession and absolution discussion. If you've been at a worship service or watched a worship service of Trinity on the Internet, you've seen that just about every service we have starts 
or at least very early on in the service, perhaps there's an opening hymn, but very early in the service, in the liturgy, the first thing we do, liturgically speaking, is confession and absolution. There is some sort of collective confession of our sinfulness and our unworthiness before God. And then after that confession is made, then I will say some variant form of, upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Well, you're not hearing, that's not me pronouncing my forgiveness, because my forgiveness isn't going to do you one bit of good at all. But when I say I forgive you all my sins, that's me using my authority to be God's mouthpiece. I'm actually proclaiming God's forgiveness to you uh, through my voice. It's sometimes good to hear. It's good to hear, I forgive you. Um, you know, in our interpersonal relationships, if there have been some sort of problem or trouble or argument, you know, it's good to hear the person that we care about say, you know what, I forgive you. I for it's, it's good to hear. Well, isn't it also even better to hear God say, I forgive you? So that's what the whole point of, of ordination is. Not that there's anything godly or divine about me, but God is very simply borrowing my voice. As an ordained pastor, when I speak, According to um, Dave, thank you for joining us tonight, sir. Uh, when I speak in accordance to God's word, when I speak in accordance to the Bible, I have the authority to speak for God. And so when you're repentant, when you confess your sinfulness, when you're repentant, and when you confess Jesus as Savior, yes, I have the authority to say, I forgive you. And I'm pronouncing God's actual little literal forgiveness to you. And so this is how this whole office of the keys things work. And that whole teaching, probably the biggest verse of that doctrine within the Lutheran church is John 20, verse 23. If Jesus saying to his apostles upon giving them the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness, it is withheld. So. That's Jesus' words, giving that authority to his uh, called and ordained pastors. Okay. All right. So that gets us to the first part. So let's go ahead and get the last section. That's going to be John 20, verses 24 through 31. So let's go ahead, put it up on the screen and read it and talk about it. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's always an enjoyable passage to read. Okay. So when they came the first time, when Jesus came the first time, which is what we looked at here, Thomas wasn't there. Who knows, maybe he was out at the 7-Eleven getting him a slurpee or something, but he wasn't home, which is kind of odd because they were in hiding, but nonetheless, he wasn't there. So now he's there, and they say, yo, we saw Jesus. He's actually alive. Isn't that great? And he's like, yeah, unless I actually see with my eyes the marks in his hands that Jesus showed him last time, you remember, or uh, the nail, the, the hole in the side from the spear, unless I see all that, I'm not believing that you guys are crazy. 
So while the other disciples struggled with fear, Thomas was wrestling with doubt. These are things that the sinful nature causes, among others. But this is what we see in the apostles. Now again, these are Jesus' hand-chosen uh, apostles. These are Jesus' hand-picked, soon-to-be pastors. I suppose all pastors are hand-picked by Jesus also, but you get the point. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect pastor, because all pastors are sinful. So this, I will believe it when I see it, is a product of our sinful nature. So like last time, Jesus came and stood among them. Now, like we said last time, the fact that Jesus is able to roll in through locked doors and stand in the middle of them, that shows him that Jesus is, uh, is truly God. And you see the same thing here. But the thing that's cool to take note of here is the fact that Jesus came to Thomas. Jesus is here specifically to address Thomas's doubt. You've heard of doubting Thomas in the Bible. Um, this is where that came from. So Jesus comes to Thomas. It wasn't up to Thomas to go figure out how to go to Jesus. Jesus came to Thomas. Same thing for you and I. Jesus comes to you and I. We are not saved by figuring out the magic formula to find our way to Jesus, but rather we are saved because Jesus comes to us through word and sacrament. And he gives the whole peace be with you again. Again, there's some repetition, but just uh, as Jesus forgave, that was Jesus pronouncing his forgiveness of the sins of the other apostles for the way that they acted on Good Friday, Jesus is now forgiving Thomas for his doubt. And the, the perhaps obvious point still should be restated, and that is the fact that even fear and doubt can and is forgiven. Now, said repeatedly, repentance plus faith equals forgiveness. Um, and repentance and faith are products of the Holy Spirit. So, um, when, when one is repentance, a repentant believer, one will always be forgiven. So the fact that Jesus came and forgave Thomas shows that he was a repentant believer. Now, he had an extreme amount of doubt at the moment, and... Um, you know, kind of towing the line towards unbelief. Robert, better late than never, sir. Thank you. Um, he was stepping towards the dangerous line of unbelief, but he hadn't crossed it yet, and God forgave him. So God forgave his apostles. God forgives me. God forgives you in Christ. All right, so peace be with you, he says. And then he see, he, he, this is also, you know, amusing. There's just so much, so much that's amusing about this text to me. Uh, he says to, he says to uh, Thomas, put your fingers in here. So he shows that where, where's the exact verbiage? Um, verse 27, he says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and place it in my side. Um, that, of course, is in what response to Thomas saying, well, i got to see the holes before I'll actually believe that. Now, again, to me, this shows Jesus' divinity. Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said those things, but he knew about it. And so, again, this is a reminder that Jesus does know all. And so he invites Thomas to do like he said it would take to get him to believe. And then Jesus says, 
Do not disbelieve, but believe. comes across as kind of a command of straighten yourself up. That's the way it kind of comes across, right? But the reality is it's more than that. This is an invitation to Jesus through the gospel to repent and believe and thus be forgiven through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is calling on Thomas to have Holy Spirit given faith through this gospel message so that he would believe. Remember, um, God wants all people in heaven. So God wants all people to believe. Jesus wants Thomas to believe. And you don't come to faith by being browbeat into it. And, you know, being you better believe or else. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. So I, 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 I stop short of considering that line by Jesus as a chastisement and a calling out, but I say it is an invitation, a gospel-driven invitation by Jesus for Thomas to believe. And we see by his reaction that he did in fact believe, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. That is a confession of faith in Jesus come, that came through the Holy Spirit. And forgiveness in Christ. So we see this forgiveness. It gives peace and it creates faith. So you're starting to see how our text now bleeds over into here, there is something unifying about the gospel. There's something unifying about the forgiveness of sins. It's drawing the apostles back together. There was a division here. But now Thomas is in the fold because this is what the Holy Spirit does to the gospel. It unifies. You know, hence the whole term communion, the communion of saints, the oneness of, of saints, the collection of the saints, all anchored on the gospel, because the gospel unifies. The sinful nature divides, the gospel unifies. And then Jesus says, are you believing because you have seen me? Well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Faith makes us a child of God, and believing without having to actually see any proof, this is what the Holy Spirit does. And then I really enjoy the last two verses of this gospel, starting in verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't written in this book. And that tells you, you know, the Bible is not here to tell us everything there is to know. But the Bible is here to tell us everything we need to know in order to get to heaven. But these that have been written are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. So there you see the, uh, the work of the gospel. These things are written so that you would believe the purpose of the word of God is to create faith. Because that's what it does, because the Holy Spirit works through it. Now, as time would go on, the gospel would go out through the world, through the church, and this is how it works today. Jesus is not standing physically in front of anybody like he did on this first Easter, but yet people are still coming to faith because Jesus comes to us today through the word and the sacraments, administered by called and ordained pastors. Uh, uh, Office of the Keys. By believing, you would have life in his name. So the work of word and sacrament creates faith, and faith gives eternal life. 
That's the intended outcome of the ministry that Jesus has called pastors into because that's what God wants, eternal life for all. And uh, the means of grace, the so-called means of grace, the means by which that happens, word and sacrament, occur in the church. And in the church, uh, they are administered on behalf of the church by an ordained pastor sent by Jesus to the congregation. So in summary, now that Easter has come and Jesus has risen from the dead, Jesus gives his power to save to his uh, to the word and the sacraments. He puts his power in the word and sacraments for the church to preach and administer. And the Holy Spirit works through these means of grace. And as the whole as the Holy Spirit works, faith is created, and that created faith then grows the church, and believers are unified in life uh, around Christ and his word. This is the function of the church according to Jesus' design. This is how it's supposed to work. So here you see the unifying power of the gospel, Holy Spirit working through the gospel. Here you see how the unifying Holy Spirit and gospel gets out through called, flawed men uh, proclaiming word and sacrament, and through that word and sacrament, uh, people are saved. All right. Very good. Well, again, we thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure of mine to spend this time with you on Wednesday evenings. I appreciate you joining us. I, I hope that if you enjoy these uh, shows, you would share these uh, videos with other people so that they can, uh, you know, learn more about the Lord and grow in their walk in the Lord and tell others so that we can grow our viewership and, you know, continue to uh, join us. Uh, pray for the ministry here at Trinity and um, continue to watch. We we very much enjoy your viewership. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and call it a night. The party's over, as they used to say back home. Um, but we'll be back next Wednesday. And of course, don't forget, as always, uh, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time, we will live stream our worship services where these texts will be the basis of the service. So with that, I pray God's richest blessings in Christ Jesus upon all of you. I thank you for joining, and I hope to see you next week. May the Lord very richly bless your day.